Today, we enter contentious territory as we embark on a savage journey to investigate who or what really killed the King of Pop. Now, it is undeniable that Michael Jackson is a controversial figure, and personally, I'm not a fan. But for the next 10 or so minutes, ad breaks excluded, we will focus solely on the circumstances surrounding his death. Was it the responsibility of a negligent doctor? Or did an international entertainment organization have something to do with it? Or was MJ's murder actually carried out at the hands of a nefarious secret satanic organization, hell-bent on destroying powerful celebrities? This is Hollywood Parallel Universe. And as per usual, I'm your devoted host, Dagula San Vicente Jr. On June 24th, 2009, Michael Jackson was rehearsing for his upcoming comeback tour when he complained about not being able to sleep. After rehearsals ended around midnight, he was returned to his Los Angeles mansion to be attended to by his physician, Dr. Conrad Murray. Throughout that night and the following morning, Murray administered various drugs to help Jackson sleep. But sometime after 12 p.m., Murray found MJ unresponsive, in a cardiac arrest, and not breathing. A short time later, he called the police, and Michael Jackson was rushed to the hospital. At 2.26 p.m., he was pronounced dead. An autopsy was performed shortly after, though initial tests did not reveal the cause. But then, two months later, a more detailed coroner's report found that the anesthetic propofol was mixed with sedatives in Jackson's system. This surely was a deadly combination, and it was odd that Murray, a physician, would not be aware of this. Therefore, on August 28, 2009, the cause of Michael Jackson's death was changed to homicide, with Conrad Murray as the prime suspect. Now, before we dive into the legal debacle that ensued following Michael Jackson's death, a little background information on MJ is necessary, but not about his personal life or career, for I am not a fan of either. Rather, what we will discuss is his relationship with narcotics and how Conrad Murray got involved in this mess. On January 27, 1984, Michael Jackson's scalp caught on fire during a Pepsi commercial shoot that resulted in third-degree burns. Due to the injury, the pop star was in so much pain that he was prescribed Darvocet and the narcotics Percocet and Demerol. This was considered the beginning of his tumultuous relationship with narcotics. By 2009, it was Michael Jackson's dependency on these drugs in combination with his declining financial wealth that led him to attempt the demanding comeback tour he was rehearsing for before his death. It was also because of his drug dependency that Murray began working for MJ. Dr. Conrad Murray was an interventional cardiologist hired by AEG Live, the entertainment company that was staging Michael Jackson's tour. According to AEG, Murray was hired at the insistence of Michael Jackson, who had a tendency of hiring doctors that would give him the drugs he wanted. Jackson was aware of Murray's flexibility because they had worked together in the past. When Murray tended to some minor illnesses Jackson suffered in Vegas about three years before his death. However, unknown to AEG and Michael Jackson, Murray was $1 million in debt and facing foreclosure on his home at the time he was hired. Therefore, he would have been in desperate need of the $150,000 a month that he was offered in order to work for MJ. It is argued that his financial strain put Murray in a position to do whatever MJ wanted in order to keep his job. This combination, Michael Jackson's drug dependency and Dr. Murray's financial troubles, may have brought about the negligence that resulted in Jackson's death. When interviewed by police officers after MJ's death, Murray stated that Michael Jackson told him to Just make me sleep no matter what. But this excuse wouldn't fly in the courtroom when evidence of other irresponsible behavior surfaced. On February 8, 2010, L.A. County prosecutors filed an involuntary manslaughter charge against Murray. During the trial, witnesses spoke of Murray's questionable practices, from administering propofol to MJ in an unmonitored setting, to his incompetence at administering basic resuscitation. In the courtroom, it was also noted that while Jackson was suffering from cardiac arrest, Murray was responding to texts and emails and was chatting on the phone. 
he did not call for help for some time, and then intentionally misinformed the paramedics and emergency doctors about what went wrong. Conrad Murray would continue to assert that Michael Jackson was even administering drugs to himself at times. But for the jury, that was still no excuse for his negligence. On November 29, 2011, Conrad Murray was convicted and sentenced to four years in prison. And what appeared to be a clear-cut case of negligent homicide was finally put to bed. Was Conrad Murray solely to blame? Or was there a company puppeteering him and everyone else behind the scenes pushing Michael Jackson to the brink for financial gain and ultimately killing him in the killing? process. Killing? Mom! Oh, we're in the middle of taping. I'm Are you kidding? Cocoa. I don't want my cocoa oh, right now, Mom. So Thank you. Today. Let's look at the whole picture, particularly what AEG might have had to do with Jackson's death. According to CNN, AEG Live, the company that was staging Michael Jackson's comeback tour, hired and supervised Dr. Conrad Murray when Michael began rehearsals. Though they stated that Murray was hired on Michael Jackson's insistence, AEG frequently corresponded with Dr. Murray so that they could ensure he was fulfilling his duties, whatever it took. In 2010, the Jackson family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against AEG. According to them, AEG ignored clear warning signs that Jackson was unwell in the months leading up to his death. Witnesses during rehearsals reported that Jackson was unable to remember lyrics and trademark dance moves, was hearing voices, and having conversations with himself. Tour production manager John Bugsy Hugdahl had even sent an email to AEG Live CEO Randy Phillips raising concerns about Michael Jackson's health. I have watched him deteriorate in front of my eyes over the last eight weeks. He was able to do multiple 360 spins back in April. He'd fall on his ass if he tried now. In addition, show director Kenny Ortega sent an email shortly after stating that Jackson was showing strong signs of paranoia, anxiety, and obsessive-like behavior. I think the very best thing we can do for him right now is get a top psychiatrist to evaluate him ASAP. But AEG did not heed the warning. Instead, Phillips went to Conrad Murray to ensure that Jackson was still on schedule with rehearsals. In a damning email written by AEG Live co-CEO Paul Gongaware to Kenny Ortega 11 days before Jackson's death, Gongaware said, We want to remind Dr. Murray that it is AEG, not MJ, who is paying his salary. We want to remind him what is expected of him. This email was used as evidence that AEG manipulated Murray by threatening his employment in order to do what was necessary to keep MJ ready for the scheduled tour. Furthermore, during the wrongful death suit, Prince Jackson, son of Michael Jackson, told the court that his father would often get off the phone with AEG executives and begin to cry. He quoted his father as saying, they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. Prince also said that the night before his father's death, he had seen Randy Phillips speaking aggressively to Murray. He was grabbing his elbow. He was grabbing by the back of his elbow and they were really close and he was making hand motions. For a doctor nearing financial ruin, the choice here could seem clear. Facing pressure from both Michael Jackson and AEG, Murray would have felt his only course of action was to comply. Despite this evidence, a court ruled in 2013 that AEG was not liable for the death of Michael Jackson and could not be held responsible for hiring Conrad Murray. As suspicious as this verdict may seem, at least the case could be finally put to rest. Unless, of course, we consider another potential player involved. Buckle up for this crazy theory. According to The Mirror, months before his death, Michael Jackson journaled about evil people wanting to destroy him to get to his music catalog. His diary allegedly revealed that he was paranoid about a target being on his back. I'm afraid someone is trying to kill me. Evil people everywhere. They want to destroy me and take my publishing company. The system wants to kill me for my catalog. I'm not selling it. His children even corroborated this account. His daughter, Paris Jackson, stated that leading up to her father's death, he was hinting that people were after him and was afraid that they might kill him. She quoted her father as saying, they're gonna kill me one day. Paris herself stated, all arrows point to that. 
It sounds like a total conspiracy theory and it sounds like bullshit, but all real fans and everybody in the family knows it. It was a setup. It was bullshit. But who would want to murder Michael Jackson for his music catalog? The Illuminati, that's who. As unbelievable as it sounds, stranger things have happened. A wild conspiracy theory exists which posits that the Illuminati murdered Michael Jackson in order to regain control over his music catalog. According to The Mirror, it is said that Michael Jackson became too powerful when he obtained the majority of rights to the Beatles catalog in 1984 and was therefore put on the Illuminati's hit list. After failing to destroy his career in other ways, they then set out to kill MJ. Interestingly enough, Michael Jackson's death occurred on the same day as Farrah Fawcett and Sky Saxon and occurred during the summer solstice. Some believe these deaths correspond with the summer solstice sacrifice as three sacrifices are necessary. Also, if you add up the date of all three deaths, 06, 25, 2009, you get 666, which is apparently iconography for the Illuminati organization. How this math adds up, I don't know. Personally, I can understand why that's hard to believe. But obviously, if anything the Illuminati did was believable and could be traced back to them, it wouldn't be that much of a secret organization now, would it? Exactly. And it does raise eyebrows when MJ's own family is suspicious as well. Either way, this theory is nearly impossible to prove unless someone in the know comes forward. Though it appears we will never know the full story behind Michael Jackson's death, a clear theme exists in all three scenarios, that of greed. Had Michael Jackson been given the care he obviously needed, his death could have been avoided, but Conrad Murray and AEG Live were so ambitiously invested in the potential profit they would gain from the Michael Jackson comeback tour that they ironically completely overlooked the condition of their moneymaker Michael Jackson. So. Was it AEG Live who was to blame? Or was it solely on the shoulders of Conrad Murray? Or perhaps it actually was the Illuminati? Tell me what you think in the comments. And do not try to fight me on Michael Jackson. I'm not a fan, so leave me alone. Otherwise, that's it for now, my friends. See you next time here on Hollywood Parallel Universe.